hear a conversation between two students about buying a used car. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Answer the questions as you listen. You will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions one to six. Hello. Hello. Can I speak to Eleanor, please? This is Eleanor speaking. Hi. My name is Jan. I'm calling about the car that was advertised on the notice board in the student union building. Is it still for sale? Yes, it is. Your ad says it's a 1985 Celica, in good condition. It's old, but it has been well looked after. My family has had the car for ten years. I'm just the third owner, and my mother had it before me, so we know its history. We've got all the receipts and records. It's had regular maintenance, and the brakes were done last year. It runs really well, but looks its age. Why are you selling it, by the way? Well, I'm going overseas next month to study. I'll be away for at least two years, so I have to sell it. Unfortunately, it's been a good car. You want fifteen hundred dollars? Is that right? I was asking two thousand dollars, but since I need to sell it quickly, I've reduced the price. Would you like to come and take it for a drive? I don't live far from the university. Yes, I'd like to have a look. What time would suit you? Any time this evening is fine. Um. Well, I finish classes at six o'clock. How about straight after that? Say six thirty. Great. I'll give you directions. When you leave the main gate of the university, turn left on South Road and keep going until you get to the Grand Cinema. Take the first right. That's Princess Street. I'm at number eighty-eight on the right. So it's eighty Princess Street. No, it's eighty-eight Princess Street, and the suburb is Parkwood. You'll see the car parked in front. It's the red one with the for sale sign on it. Okay. Thanks, Eleanor. I'll see you later. Bye. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Later that day, at the university, Jan meets up with her friend Sam, and tells him about the car. Hi, Sam. Hey, Jan. What's happening? I'm glad I ran into you. I've decided I have to get a car. You're going to buy a car? Do you really need one? I'd probably still be driving, except that my car broke down last year. Instead of getting another one, I just moved closer to the university and went back to riding a bike. Better for the environment, better for my health, and I save a lot of money. Did it really cost that much? Well, when you think of registration, insurance, rising petrol costs, parking plus maintenance and repairs, it adds up.、Mm, I know it's going to be expensive, but I really need my own transportation. It takes half an hour by bus each way to university, as it is. But now I'm working at night in the city. There's no way I want to hang around waiting for a bus late at night, then walk three blocks home alone. Hey, I think you've got a point there. So, what kind of car are you looking at? It's an '85 Celica, same kind as I used to have. The owner's asking fifteen hundred dollars. That's pretty old. How many kilometres has it done? You know, I forgot to ask. I'll have to check tonight when I go to see it. Would you be able to come with me to have a look at about six thirty? Sure, I'll come. But I don't know a lot about cars. I do know one thing, though. I wouldn't buy an old car without having a mechanic look at it first. That's a good idea. But won't it cost a lot? 
Not really. You can get a check done through the Automobile Association for $80, and it comes with a report on the condition of the car. It can save you a lot of money in the long run. I'll keep that in mind. So we have to get to Parkwood at 6.30. Do you want to take the bus? It goes straight down South Road every 15 minutes. Or maybe we could walk. I don't think it's that far. Actually, I could borrow my roommate's motorbike for an hour or so. He's working all evening in the library. Do you think he'd mind? No way. He owes me a favour or two. OK, great. See you at six, outside the student centre. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to listen to two students talking about a presentation on time management. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Hi, Mark. What are you doing? Hi, Lucy. Well, I, I'm preparing this seminar on time management. I'm supposed to do a presentation on the topic next week. Ironic, isn't it? I'm probably the worst student when it comes to time management. I don't think you're that bad compared to some other people I know. Do you need some help with it? Yeah. I just don't know where to start, to be honest. When are you doing the presentation? I'm supposed to hand in the draft on Wednesday at 11am. The presentation is scheduled for 10am this Friday. That's not too bad. This gives you the whole weekend to prepare. Let's brainstorm some ideas, shall we? Do you want to get a pen and paper to jot down some thoughts? I think you should start with a broad general statement. For example, I read somewhere that organising time is a skill like learning to drive or tying your shoelaces. Then you could move on to discussing the common problems people have with managing time. That's not a bad idea. One of the common problems is putting things off. Yeah, you could also mention some common signs of this symptom such as last-minute holiday shopping, pulling off visits to the doctors or the dentists. Another problem is relying too much on your memory and not writing things down. Do you mean not keeping a diary or a planner to plan the tasks? That's right. For example, writing down what I need to do in a diary or a planner helps me remember what I need to do and makes me more focused on the tasks for the day. Good idea! Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. That reminds me of something I've been meaning to do for a while now. Anyway, I should also include some advice on how to deal with the problem, shouldn't I? Sure, you can talk about some ways of stopping procrastination. I guess making a to-do list can help one focus on what needs to be done. 
Definitely. Another way to deal with the problem is to prioritize and do the hardest job first, the one which requires the most effort and concentration. Also, my tutor recommended that I should break big projects into small parts with a specific goal. Having an action plan has worked for me. I usually make a list of small tasks I need to do to achieve a goal. Sometimes I just don't feel like getting down to work because a task seems too overwhelming for me to even think about. This technique helps me reduce psychological pressure. If I think of a project as a set of easily achievable tasks, don't you think? I know what you mean. I often feel like that myself with the statistics project I've been doing this term. I'm well behind, and the deadline is next week. I think setting deadlines and sticking to them can help one to achieve goals. You can discuss this aspect in your presentation too. A good point. Setting deadlines can also help one become more realistic about the time it takes to do tasks. Another point you could include is how to deal with interruptions. Okay, I guess blocking in time to handle unpredictable interruptions can help one stay focused. Not just that, some interruptions, such as phone calls, can be easily avoided by using answering machines, for example. Saying no. Which is one of the most useful words in English is also very effective. It can be tough sometimes, but you've got to learn to say it nicely but firmly. I think you've got enough ideas here to start with. Definitely. Thanks a lot for your help. I just need to type the ideas up, and I think I'm all set. Do you think you can lend me your laptop for a couple of hours? Hmm. I'm afraid I can't. I've got to finish my own project. Never mind. I'll use one at the library. You certainly know how to say no. <laughs> Learned it the hard way. Got to go now. Good luck with the presentation. Cheers. See you later. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You are going to hear a conversation between an interviewer and a professor. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-six. Today I'm here with Professor Nitik, who is our new university president. He has been a professor for twenty years and teaches many of the best classes on campus. I know many of you have had him as a teacher and know of his brilliance. Good morning, Professor Nitik. Thank you for stopping by the student station. Thank you for having me here. It is always great to get to meet many of the students who are involved with our school. I haven't been here since two years ago. Yes, I remember at that time you were still teaching every semester. Two years later, you are only teaching every once in a while. But it seems like you are still always busy. The administration world is just as busy as the teaching world for you. How do you stay in touch with the university? Even with the change in your everyday duties, I try to stay in touch with what is popular with the university students. I usually spend time with as many students as I can. They usually give me insight into what the new concerns and beliefs are for the new generation. On top of that, 
I try to be as youthful as I can. I consider myself to be youthful, at least for my age. So I always have a good time and try to stay young. I try my best to not just be a teacher, but also participate in university life. Interesting. So, are you still doing lots of academic work, or are you mostly concentrating on administrative affairs? Well, I mostly do administrative affairs now, but that doesn't mean that I still don't have a very deep interest in academic matters. I often visit other campuses around the world and meet other professors in my field. I learn the most by travelling and seeing the different places of the world and the different fields of thought. I even did a television program last month in Manchester. Will you be on television any time soon, then? Well, you can call the television station and see if I will be on television any time soon. Maybe I will be on the news report. I don't think it is really that significant, though. Oh, really? That sounds great. I will remember to look out for you. Let's move on. With all your busy travelling recently, how do you find time for your personal life? I try to keep my university life separate from my personal life. Sometimes it's hard to find time to just take my wife and three kids out for a family dinner, but usually we all manage to get together every few days. I'm taking a few weeks off next month to take my family down to South America to Brazil for a few days. I can't wait to just sit on the beach. Wow, that sounds like a wonderful trip. Professor Nitik, could you tell the audience a little about what goes on in an average day of a university administrator? <laughs> an average day? Oh, I don't think there is such thing as an average day for me. The last few weeks I've been travelling all the time. I can be in Los Angeles in the morning and in New York by the afternoon, and back to Los Angeles by the evening. Sometimes I will spend the whole week at a new university. Showing the new administrators the ins and outs of running a university. Sometimes I can spend the whole day in the office on the phone. So there really is no average day for me. I guess that is because I do so many different tasks. Sorry to let all the viewers down, but that is the plain truth. Now look at questions twenty-seven to thirty. Now listen to the tape and answer questions twenty-seven to thirty. Well, I guess I can sum it up for them. You are a busy man. That is probably a good description. So, are there any immediate plans for the coming few weeks? Well, I'm in Los Angeles for the next two days, and then I fly to Colorado to meet a new prospective professor for our university. I will be in Colorado for about a week. Then I go to Japan for the next ten days to meet with our university branch in Japan about record sales there. After that, I return to Los Angeles for a week, just in time for the graduation of the class of two thousand and one. There you have it, my next month's schedule. Thank you very much, Professor Nitik. I always enjoy having you on our show. We hope to have you back on our show next time. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecturer talking about the process of fossilization. 
first, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The foremost exhibition in any great natural history museum is almost invariably a skeleton of a large dinosaur, often the famous Tyrannosaurus rex or T-Rex as it's usually known. Thus, one would think that these skeletons are plentiful, one for each museum and more to spare in the basement. Well, here's an interesting fact. Almost every one of those T-Rex skeletons are just copies of the original fossils, and we only have 20 sets of these in the whole world. And the most complete is still missing one-fifth of its bones, and the rest are missing a lot more. And given that these dinosaurs once numbered in the thousands, and existed on this earth for perhaps three million years, you can realize an obvious fact Fossilization is actually an extremely rare occurrence. Fossilization can only occur when, after an animal dies, it is buried in soft mud or silt relatively quickly before the body completely rots or is torn to pieces by scavengers. Given this fact, the overwhelming majority of fossils are in marine sediment, where former marine life sank to the sea bottom, where sediment was being continually deposited. This means that we have a fairly good idea of the life in Earth's ancient oceans, but a much sketchier view of the land-based life forms. Fossilization on land needs water and mud, meaning that it is most often near ancient river sites and lakes. But it is still so rare that there are, in fact, large stretches of geological time about which we don't quite know what was happening at all. So. Given that fossilization is so rare, the natural question is, what can increase its odds? Well, fossilization mostly occurs with organisms which meet three basic criteria. One, they must have hard body parts, for example, shells, plates, bones and teeth. Unfortunately, the soft parts just rot away far too quickly to be fossilized. And I say unfortunately because it is often the soft fleshy features that most interest us. An elephant's trunk, for example, would not fossilize and from the skeleton alone we would never know the trunk was there. The second criterion for more likely fossilization is that the organism in question must have existed in considerable numbers and be spread over a wide geographical range. This simply increases the statistical probability that one of them will one day be fossilized and hopefully found. Finally, and by the same logic, the species needs to have existed on the Earth for a long time, and the longer, the better. So, these are the three main criteria, but there are others. Being a large size, for example, helps us to notice and discover them as fossils more easily and being a marine organism, as mentioned, helps also. Trilobites, a strange sort of ancient crab, are a perfect example. Their body structure was one of hard plates. They existed over virtually the whole world of their time and over a huge span of geological history, over 250 million years, in fact, one of the longest ranges of any creature ever. Added to this, some species could grow to relatively large sizes, and they lived in the sea. Perfect. These creatures meet all the criteria, and as a result, museums all over the world are spilling over with trilobite fossils of all shapes and sizes. As far as fossils go, they are common. So, let's think about T-Rex once again. It too basically meets all the criteria that we mentioned. It has hard parts, being the bones, had some dispersion, and had been around for a long time. 
although it cannot compare to trilobites in this respect. However, it does have one important advantage over trilobites. It is large, very large, which means we can discover it far more easily than many other fossils. And here's another advantage. Dinosaur hunters are a dedicated and fanatical breed, continually at work in all the likely sites of the world. Basically, us human beings are fascinated by these creatures. So much that we are always searching for them, probably more than any other types of fossil, meaning that more T-Rexes will inevitably spring up in the future, and one is certainly glad for this. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.